think I got this going. We'll see how we'll see how long it lasts. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I'll wait another couple of minutes, inshallah. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll get started. But, uh, uh. نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين السلاة والسلام عليك يا سيد المرسلين يا خاتم النبيين يا شفيع المذنبين يا نيس الغريبين يا رحمة للعالمين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم آم you know, we've been, as, well, last class was three weeks ago. So, you know, last week, of course, was the 27th. Uh, and because most people have been up all night, uh, we canceled the class. And then the week before, I was tied up. Uh, so, uh, inshallah, we'll resume today. And for those who remember, we were talking about the events in Kufa before Imam Hussein al-Islam uh, leaves Mecca for Kufa. So, uh, uh, any questions so far on, on anything that people remember? Good. Uh, the We'll kind of resume a little bit. We talked about, if you remember, uh, you know, Imam Hussein al Islam, just kind of a quick overview, and then we'll come back to some things. Um, is that, you know, Imam Hussein al Islam leaves Medina Munawwara for, uh, for uh, Makkah at the end of the month of Rajab. And he arrives in Makkah at the beginning of. Uh, Shaban and this is when he starts receiving all these letters from Kufa asking him to come and join them and to lead them uh, you know, against the uh, tyrannical rule of Yazid uh, and so he sends Muslim bin Aqil his cousin to Kufa to evaluate the situation so Muslim bin Aqil actually leaves uh, at the end or in the middle of the month of Ramadan. So he leaves in the middle of the Ramadan to go and evaluate the situation. Um, he arrives in Kufa with a lot of difficulty. But once he's in Kufa, which is the beginning of the month of Shawwal, you know, he's welcomed by the people. 
uh, people are coming and accepting him and taking allegiance uh, at his hands on behalf of Imam Hussein al -Islam. So they're taking allegiance with Imam Hussein al -Islam at the hands of Muslim bin Aqil uh, and promising to uh, you know, sacrifice their lives and their wealth uh, in his defense and accepting him as their leader uh, and f uh, acknowledging or, or rather promising to follow him uh, wherever he or however he leads them. So you have thousands of people taking this allegiance and literally by the end you have close to 40,000 people who've taken allegiance at the hands of Muslim and Aqeel radiallahu anhu. And so now, <clears throat> this is when he writes the letter to Imam Hussein al-Islam telling him situation's really good, come on, you know, people are ready to accept you and to, uh, and give you allegiance. So this is when he in Mecca starts making arrangements uh, to, to eventually leave. In the meantime, as we mentioned, you know, before, you know, Yazid is sent word through various channels, through his spies, of what's going on in Kufa. The governor of Kufa at this time is Noman bin Bashir, radiallahu who is a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu who is, um, you know, his heart is with Imam Hussein al-Islam, but he is uh, become part of the government. And whenever that happens, there are always issues. And so he does not stop Muslim bin Aqil from, from doing what he's doing uh, out of respect and, and, and honor. Uh, and so then, uh, however, when Yazid receives word, he sends a message to Abaydullah ibn Ziyad, uh, who is a ruthless, I guess, uh, you can say ruthless dictator, but dictator implies ruthless. Uh, so he, he's, you know, he's a ruthless governor of Basra, uh, who has been a very effective, uh, or I guess what you would call a very effective administrator for Banu Umayya. Uh, you know, he's the guy they go to when there's trouble, uh, because they know he has no limits uh, as far as, uh, you know, reaching his objective and his objective is always total control so that's why they, they he's the go-to guy and same thing in this situation so right now he's the governor of Basra he's also promised to become the governor of Kufa uh, if he handles this for Yazid uh, and the orders are really stop Imam Hussein al Islam period a lot of people try to say, no, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. I mean, those were the orders. Uh, stop him at whatever cost. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there are many things that are and on a governmental level that are implied but not said, so that later on the government, you know, the, the ruling party can always, you know, claim uh, or deny any responsibility or any knowledge of what took place. You know, we didn't order that, you know. We see the same thing today. So governments don't change, people don't change as a whole. So anyway, so when Ibn Ziyad, of course, you know, as we mentioned last time, which was three weeks ago, he comes in, he assumes the governorship, he comes in in disguise and people are assuming or thinking that's Imam Hussein Islam because they're expecting him to have left. Of course, there's no communication back then like you have today where you just pick up the phone and say, I'm on my, on my way and this is where I am. You know, there it was like, okay, yeah, he's, he's leaving. We don't know when he's left uh, you know, or when he will leave. And so the assumption is he's already left and now they see this strange person walking in dressed uh, the way it was known that uh, Imam Hussein Islam and his men used to dress. And so when people see him, they automatically assume, oh, this is him. Which to him, you know, is also a test because this confirms everything that he had heard. 
you know, he had heard about uh, all this stuff going on, so now this just confirms all that to him. He goes, he kicks the kicks Noman bin Bashir out of the governor house and assumes control. Uh, and then from there, uh, he, uh, you know, basically sends word throughout Kufa that he's arrived. Uh, he arrests various people that are, um, I guess, heads of clans and tribes. Uh, so these are well-respected people, people that people look up to in the community, and so these are the people that are getting arrested. Uh, the people basically uh, march on the house uh, with uh, Muslim bin Aqil, and then he threatens them, and then they all leave. Because they also know that this is a person who, again, has no limits. He has the full authority of the state behind him, which means that basically the militia, the army, everything is his, you know, to command as he wills. Um, and just like people today, you know, when you see an atrocity or when you see crimes being committed, you know, the number of people who truly are willing to stand up and sacrifice uh, or have or give real sacrifices is very small. And the number of people who give lip service is very large. Uh, and so no different than as it is today. And we're seeing that today. I mean, you know, for those who who think that humanity has uh, evolved to something better, I mean, they should wake up. The only thing we're better at is how to kill each other. Yeah, that's the only thing we become more efficient at. Uh, you know, I mean, people say that, oh, you know, technology has made us more efficient. It made us more efficient in wasting time. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it's interesting. If I look at the scholars in the past, um, most of them died in their 50s. Uh, some 60s, you have rare ones that went up to 80s or 90s. Uh, and yet, within those 50 years, these are people who studied thousands of books, <laughs> wrote hundreds of books, uh, and, you know, and, and literally, you know, you look at the works that they did, uh, you know, it's like, how do they have time? And that's because they didn't waste time. Uh, and that was the key. So there was blessings in their time. You know, when we look at today, all the barakah, all the blessings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken back because we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And so, you know, you think about it, you, know, you waste a whole day just looking at stuff on your phone. Uh, and you gain nothing from that, literally nothing from it. You know, playing video games, uh, wasting time doing this, wasting time doing that. And then when there is some time, then, you're, then because the mindset is so messed up, you know, we're all left thinking, what, what, what do I do now? You know, oh, I got some free time. What do I do? Oh, let me pick up my phone and look at something. All right. And then another few hours wasted again. Right. Instead of getting up and doing something, is oh, you know, we think for two minutes and, oh, you know, easy out. Let me pick my phone up. Let me look at the computer. Let me do this. Let me do that. Um, and so, you know, the rate of the degradation of society as a whole has accelerated. The rate of efficiency in other things really has not. Okay. And again, we're, we're seeing that. Uh, anyone who wants to wake up and you know, smell the coffee or the roses or whatever they smell, you know, it's in front of them, okay? Um, so coming back to the point, 
So he brings, you know, he arrests these people. And then, and this, this basically gives him the opportunity to, to threaten the city as a whole. Basically let them know I'm in charge. What I say is go, what I say goes. And if anyone opposes me, you know, we will deal with them. Uh, and everybody knew how he would deal with them. You know, it would not be a very uh, pleasant dealing. So you have a lot of these, a vast majority of these people who had pledged allegiance who now, eh, you know, are on shaky ground. And Muslim bin Aqil, realizing this and seeing this, he goes into hiding in the house of Hani bin Urwa, who is a very decent, respectful, righteous man. Uh, and he takes Muslim bin Aqil under you know, into his house, hides him, waiting for a chance for the cover, you know, for things to blow over so that he can get him out. Because now the big concern on everyone's mind who has any decency is we need to let Imam Hussein al Islam know and stop him from coming. Somehow get him a message to stop him from coming. Uh, and, uh, you know, but again, you have so many spies, basically, you know, half, if not more, of the city is now spies, either under threat or under, you know, uh, bribe. So either they're being bribed to say, okay, you do this, and we'll give you this, or if you, do, if you don't do this, we'll do this, and this is what's going on. Uh, and so, so while Imam, while Muslim, Imam Muslim is in his house, Hani falls ill. And Hani being a very well-respected member of the uh, community of Kufa, well-known person, uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad uh, decides to go and make a visit. He has his spies who've already told him, yeah, this is where we think he is. Now he goes. And when they know that he's coming, there's a plan that's set, uh, that he will come and when an Imam Muslim will be in the next room, and when it seems like everything is clear, Hani will give a, give a signal, and yeah, it went out. I don't know what it's doing. It went out again. So the vo voice is going down. So, uh, so Hani, uh, so that was what, 20 minutes? Yep, 20 minutes and it went out. So anyway, so, uh, anyway, the Lord Ibn Ziyad comes to visit. Hani gives the signal. And Muslim bin Aqil puts his hand on his sword and doesn't move. And after Ibn Ziyad leaves, he's noted things that are out of place. So he's sure now that he's there. Uh, he, uh, you know, or at least that Hani knows where he is and has been hiding him. So when Muslim bin Aqil comes out though, Hani asked him, why didn't you do what we had agreed to? And he said that I was about to, but uh, then uh, I, 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 did, I stopped uh, because you know, I am a guest in your house and for me to do this in your house would have laid the blame of treachery upon you. And and I also remember Rasulullah talking about, you know, deception and killing someone through deception uh, and not liking that, and so I stopped. You know, there are certain conditions where certain things are 
you know, a lot of these things are conditional. Muslim bin Aqil felt at that moment that, uh, and especially for his host, say he felt that it was better not to do anything. So he doesn't do anything. Uh, Ubaidullah, when he gets back to the governor's house, sends, mess, sends, or sends his men to go and arrest Hani. And so they come and they arrest him. And by this point, you know, because it, they're also thinking, yeah, we think he knows something. Muslim bin Aqil has left the house. By the time they come, they arrest him. They take him to the governor's house. They, they lock him up. And uh, so now Muslim bin Aqil marches on the governor's house with 4,000 men. And same thing, you know, because, you know, all these, you know, he threatens Hani. He threatens them, uh, and they all disperse, and Muslim bin Aqil you know, escapes at that point. Uh, he's given refuge in the house of this woman who recognizes who he is, but eventually her son, uh, yeah, eventually her son gives him up. video on the thing's not, not working for some reason. It's been doing this and I don't know what the deal is. It says sound thing, but yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's right. Oh, that's right. I know it's right. Yeah, I know. But I was Adi Yogi. No. Oh, it's me Adi? No. Oh. Adi T? Hang on, let me adjust this or see what happens. Wait a minute. Yeah, it didn't want to stop either. Oh, no, something happened, let's see. It's a delayed reaction. The joys of technology. She'll up, it'll get uploaded later on, inshallah. Uh, so anyway, but uh, so her her son, you know, discloses to uh, uh, Hani and uh, to uh, obey the law. Sorry. Okay. So he discloses, and so when Muslim bin Aqil goes, and um, um, I mean, or rather, Muslim bin Aqil then is arrested, brought to the house, to the governor's, I guess, estate or whatever you call it, governor house, um, and and then what they do is they want him to say things against Imam Hussein al Islam. Uh, and they want him to announce this statement publicly. Uh, so, you know, he pretends like, yeah, he'll do it. Yaka, or whatever was for the, the product. Uh, publicly, and then um, what happens is, that they take him to the top of the roof 
he makes instead of cursing Imam Hussein Islam, he praises Imam Hussein Islam uh, and uh, refutes the arguments of, of his opponents or his enemies. And instead of, uh, uh, you know, so basically doing the opposite of what they wanted him to do. And so they kill him right then, and which he knew. Uh, and and Hani is also killed. So so basically, you know, the main supporters are all taken out uh, or put under house arrest, and that's the thing that happens. According to most sources, this happened uh, on the same day that Imam Hussein al-Islam leaves Mecca, which is the eighth, uh, the eighth of Zilhaj. He leaves Mecca to come towards Kufa. So this occurred on the same day. Um, you know, before we kind of go any further into that, uh, and we get into you know Imam Hussein Islam and, and him traveling, you know, a few things that we need to kind of remind ourselves of, uh, and that that are important to understand, uh, because you know we, we talk about these events, uh, and we talk about the sacrifice and and you know and all of the atrocities that were committed against them, uh, you know, and in our minds we we see you know, fear and we see uh, grief and we see all of these things, uh, you know, from the outside looking in. Uh, but when you truly look into these people, you know, when you, when you see, when you're able to, to look inside, you know, you realize uh, that, uh, that there is nothing but peace and serenity within them. And this gets back to where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he mentions his friends uh, in various places. And he says uh, that, Which, you know, basic translation is, uh, upon the friends of Allah, upon the friends of God, there is no grief or there is no fear and there is no grief. Uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not burden His friends with, with these things. You know, because they have sacrificed everything for Him. Uh, and so, and when we talk about like Imam Hussein al-Islam, we talk about, you know, his brother Imam Hassan al-Islam or Ali and, and all of these. These aren't simply the friends of Allah. You know, these aren't the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God has chosen as his friends or made his friends. These are the makers of his friends. You know, people are made his friends through them. Uh, there is no friendship with Allah. There is no submission to Allah uh, unless we acknowledge these people. Uh, because these are the ones that he loves. And then by associating ourselves with them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us as well. Uh, so that's why it's really important. So like when I'm talking about Muslim bin Aqil, you know, and, and everything that he goes through, he knows what he's doing. And, and more so, he knows why he's doing what he's doing. And, and, and in the why, he has accepted all of the worldly issues that come with it. And he's at peace with that, uh, you know. And so, the uh, the you know the serenity of the heart uh, comes with the remembrance of Allah, uh, and comes with the connection with the friends of Allah. You know? And so, this is important to to note. So, everything that they're going through. Again, when we look at it from the outside, you think, oh, you know, all of this. Uh, and for us, it is sad, you know, because we see those, these people who have sacrificed everything just so the true message reaches us. Uh, and, uh, and then we see what we do with that message. And that should make us sad. You know, not... You know, that we are not fulfilling our end of the bargain. Right. 
So, so the same thing, you know, again, with, with all of these, you know, because these are people who have truly submitted themselves to the will of Allah. And again, in so doing, they are satisfied with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God chooses for them. And they're content with it. They are pleased, not just content, they are pleased with it. Hmm? Uh, it's funny, like, uh, or interesting, you know, like today they, they tell you, oh, you know, be yourself. You know, but the problem is most of us, most people don't even know what themselves are. You know, it's not be yourself, it's be who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be. You know, that is how you attain that serenity, that peace. That's how you, you know, no longer fear this world or anything <coughs> associated with it. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, and that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you into his fortress. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, like um, it's something that we'll probably talk about later. I've talked about before, and I'll mention it here as well. So this happens years later. Uh, you know, Mamun Rashid becomes the king, and he becomes the king by saying that he's going to make Imam Ali Rida his um, heir. So if anything happens to him, he will be the ruler and he will take care of the affairs of the people. And everybody knew Imam Ali Rida and knew his, that he would be just and, and a wise leader who would emphasize the, uh, the significance of the justice of Islam uh, so that everybody is given their due rights. And so what they... So this is why they supported Mamun, and eventually Mamun, because there's a tussle between two, two other brothers, the three of them, and eventually Mamun becomes the king. So when he goes, you know, Mamun takes him from uh, Baghdad, because Baghdad at that point had become the capital, all the way to Khurasan, which is basically at the edge of, where he took him was the edge of Afghanistan today. So they travel all the way there because this is where a lot of his supporters had come from. And these people again had supported Mamun because, you know, he had, he had told them that he was going to make Imam Ali Rida, you know, the, the, the king to be. Uh, he had other plans, of course, like politicians do, like kings do. Uh, but when he arrives there, you have thousands of people there to meet him. And they're not there to meet the king. And the king's kind of like, you know, a lot of times, you know, people come, they meet the king, and they meet somebody on the side, you know, just because this is, okay, the side piece. And they, their total intention was to meet Imam Ali Rida, and they would meet the king because the king was with him. You know, so it's total backwards. And when the king sees this, it's also, in his mind, you know, kings are always concerned about their power. And if they see anybody more popular than themselves, ah, oh, you know, I need to do something. So the people, you know, all of these people that came to meet him were scholars. Uh, and they asked Imam Ali Rida to narrate a saying that he had heard from his father, who had heard from his father, who had heard from his father, and so on, until they, they heard from their father, who heard directly from the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then, um, you know, and so he stands up in front of all of them. And he makes this, uh, you know, he says that I, uh, Ali Rida, uh, heard from my father, uh, Imam Musa Kaibin, who heard from his father, Imam Jafar Sadiq, who heard from his father, Imam Muhammad Baqir, who heard from his father, Imam uh, Ali Zainal Abidin, who heard from his father, Imam Hussein al-Islam, who heard from his father, Ali bin Abi Talib, who heard from Rasulullah sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so they asked for a hadith from Rasulullah Sallallahu They're hearing a hadith, a Qudsi, which is where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that God or Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said. It's not part of the Quran, but this is a saying of Allah directly uh, 
through the lips of Rasulullah and the saying is that Allah Subhanahu says that La ilaha illallah is my fortress. You know, in the declaration that there is no one worthy to worship, there's nothing to be worshipped except Allah, is my fortress. And whoever enters my fortress hmm, will be safe. So this is the narration. And so when they hear this, they're all you know very happy. Uh, and they're saying takbir Allah, akbar Allah, akbar Allah is great, Allah is great. Uh, and so Imam Ali Rida, he says, but, yeah, but uh, there are conditions to this. And I am one of those conditions, meaning the love of the household of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is a condition to this. All right. So, you know, just like, uh, you know, you have prerequisites, you know, especially an easy thing. You know, like when you're when you're in college or you know school, you know you can't take this course until you've taken this course, uh, you, know, you know, or like in Islam, you know, making salat has no meaning if I don't have wudu. You know, they're prerequisites. So the prerequisite to the kalma la ilaha illallah uh, being a fortress for me and making me safe is that I have within my heart the love of the ones that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala loves, which includes the household of. And especially includes rather the household of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So again, when we're talking about these people, when we're talking about Imam Hussein Islam, again, he's not just the friend of Allah. He is the one who makes others the friends of Allah. Uh, and so he brings them into this security, this serenity, this peace within oneself. You know, because when you acknowledge this, then the attacks start coming from the outside. You know, but you see people. You know, a lot of pe most people are like ducks. You know, from the top. You know, when a duck is swimming, you know, on the top it looks like ah, you know, everything's calm. Well, you look underneath and you see those legs pedaling like crazy. Hmm? You know, so that's most people. You know, and they they may put this facade on, of of calmness and, and serenity, but when you look inside, yeah, it's the exact opposite. You know, with these people, because of all the attacks from the outside, looking at them from the outside, even though, you know, you still see that nur, that light of Allah, reflecting off of them. You know, so you see, you know, just, so looking upon them just gives you this peace. But again, you know, because of everything going on outside, you, you read the, you know, the events of what happened, and you think, oh, you know, all of this. But when you really look inside, there's nothing but calm and serenity. You know, because they are, they are pleased with whatever Allah SWT has chosen for them. Okay? So long as they, they know that He is pleased with them. So as long as He's pleased with them, they don't worry about anything. And this is what we want to attain. And the only way to really attain that is to connect ourselves with them, to know them, to love them, uh, and to uh, be, be willing to implement uh, that, you know, all of the requirements of that love. Yeah. So this is why, again, you know, again, when we look at like Muslim bin Aqeel and everything that he went through, you know, from the outside reading that, you think, oh, you know, this is uh, so horrible. No. But he himself was at peace. Because, again, true peace, Allah Subhanahu wa says, you know, is in the remembrance of Allah. But that doesn't simply mean that, that I keep repeating certain words. That's part of it. You know. But it also, that means, you know, in remembering him, I remember the ones that he also loves. I love the ones that he loves. Uh, and I connect myself with, connect myself with them. Yeah. So, so now coming back to Imam Hussein al-Islam. So again, the same day that Muslim bin Aqeel is martyred, Imam Hussein al-Islam leaves Mecca. And again, and this date is very significant because it is the 8th of Zilhaj. The 8th of Zilhaj is so significant for most people because this is the day that they leave, you know, those who have come to Mecca leave Mecca. Those who are on the way, they go straight to Mina okay. to begin the rites of the Hajj, of the pilgrimage. 
But, so this is the day that people are going for the Hajj, to begin the Hajj, begin the rites of the Hajj. And yet this is the very same day that Imam Hussein al-Islam is leaving Mecca, going in a different direction towards Kufa. Uh, you think about that, he could have waited a few days. He simply could have waited five or six days and made the Hajj and then gone to Kufa. But he doesn't do that. Because he wants to emphasize a point. These people are going to make the Hajj. He's going to save the Hajj. You know, you know, because the Hajj <laughs> isn't simply the ritual rites of, oh, you know, we do the pilgrimage, we do this, we do that. Uh, no. It's the spirit of it. It is the essence of it, the soul of it. And this is what he is going to, to, to go and save. Because you can go through all of these rites and not have anything. And this is what we're seeing today. And this is why Rasulullah also said that a time will come that, uh, you know, when uh, the leaders will come for the Hajj for show, the wealthy will come for vacation. You know, 2.5 million people made the Umrah. They were there on the 27th night, record number. You know, and I can, I can easily say that the majority of them were on vacation. So he said the wealthy will come for vacation. The middle class will come for business. You know, they'll come and they'll do this dealing and that dealing there. You know, and then the poor will come to beg. So who's coming for the Hajj? You know, and this is exactly what we're seeing. You know, exactly what he told us is exactly what's happening. You know, and we see this all. Uh, so now, the, you know, but, you know, as I mentioned three weeks ago, before he leaves, um, various companions, very close companions of the Prophet Wasallam, who were also good friends of Imam Hussein al-Islam, and some of them who were related, like even his brother-in-law, they come to him and they say, you know, why are you going? Look. You know, you know, you know, and they didn't say, why are you going? You're doing something wrong. No, they knew what he's doing is the right thing. But they're saying, look, we don't want you to go, you know, because we know what the people of Kufa did to your father and what they did to your brother. You know, they didn't do right by them. And so we expect the same with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so please don't go. Just stay, and then we'll figure something out. Imam Hussein Islam knows that when guidance is taken out of the heart, or when there's no guidance that ever entered the heart, such people have no limits to what they're willing to do. They have no problem in, you know, in killing people, in torturing people, in doing whatever. And nothing is sacred for these people. So nothing's off limits. He understands that point. These people have forgotten that point. They will, they will be reminded of it later on. And to Abdullah ibn Zubair, he said that my, my grandfather said that the Kaaba will be desecrated because of a, of a lamb. You know, a lamb is, a, uh, is an innocent creature. So, so the person that's going to be desecrated for will, have, you know, will not be responsible for what happens, but still they will use that excuse of this certain person. So this is the analogy that the Prophet Sussum is giving. And he says, and I don't want to be that lamb. And the interesting thing is that the lamb, when we look at to what happens afterwards, the lamb will be Abdullah ibn Zubair, to whom he's saying this. Okay. And because these are the people who are the sons to the door to the city of knowledge. Because the door of the city of knowledge is Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu, Rasulullah himself is the city. Uh, and uh, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and Islam are the sons of Ali who, who are connected to that door. Yeah. So, so now, you know, he sets out with 72 people. That's all that, that's leaving with him. Uh, of which 
uh, you have 25, uh, roughly 25 friends and associates, and the rest of them are family members, uh, nephews, half brothers, uh, you know, cousins, uh, sisters, daughters, nieces. Um, so, you know, this is important point to note. So if somebody, because a lot of people say, oh, he did khuruj, which means that he, he set out for war, which he did not because you don't go and do war, you know, you don't set out for war, uh, you know, with your nieces and nep uh, nephews and, and daughters and, and, and wives and sisters and, you know, that's not the way you go for war. But even if he did, you know, again, he is Imam Hussein al-Islam and he is the explanation or part of the explanation to the Quran. He is connected to the Quran. So if my understanding is that he shouldn't have done it, then my understanding is wrong. Okay. But he didn't. You know, he's simply going from Mecca to Kufa, and there he will assess the situation and to make decisions as to what to do next. Okay. Uh, big question that comes up, because we know that the battle that will take place in Karbala will truly be a battle between truth and falsehood, a battle between belief and disbelief. Uh, and of course, a lot of people say, oh, no, 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 it wasn't belief and disbelief, it was simply truth and, and falsehood, All right. whatever their meaning of that is. And then others say, no, how can you say that? You know, If it was that, then all of the companions would have joined. Why didn't any of the other companions join him? You know, so a simple answer of that, you know, of course, these are people, when they throw this out, they're trying to confuse people. And you see this a lot. You know, people throw something out, you know, because they're expecting the person that they're throwing it out at doesn't know and won't be able to defend his position. Uh, and so then you confuse them, and now, you know, it's like the devil's wh whisper. You know, it just kind of sets in and starts to ferment in, the, in that brain. And they know this. You know, and uh, and unfortunately, they know that most people don't know and won't be able to give a, give a response. Uh, uh, and this is basically why we have these classes: is that people learn and will know how to deal with such situations. the The answer to that is very simple, actually. You know, so if I look at the Battle of Badr, Battle of Badr took place, you know, second year of Hijra. The leaders of Quraysh brought an army, a thousand men strong, fully equipped, ready for war, to come and annihilate the Muslims and the Prophet okay. Prophet had set out from Medina with 313 men, not going to war, okay, but to stop a caravan. And yet, and, and during this process is when the army leaves, and now they're, they're, they're face to face, you know, three days march from Medina in face, face to face with, with an army that's three times their size, well equipped, while they're not equipped, uh, ready for war. Now, if I look at this time, you had 2,000 able-bodied fighting men in Medina, yet only 313 of them are with the Prophet Sallallahu Everybody agrees that this was a battle between faith, belief and disbelief, between truth and falsehood. Everybody agrees that. So why weren't the other 1,300 or, or what, no, why weren't the other 1,700 men or so there? Were they not companions of the Prophet Of course they were. Were they not good Muslims? Of course they were. Did they not love Rasulullah Of course they did. But why weren't they there? They weren't there because they didn't think, they didn't know that this was going to happen. The assumption was when they left Medina was they were simply going to stop a caravan from taking goods to Mecca that was going to allow Mecca, or the people of Mecca to become ready to come and fight the people of Medina. That's what they were going out for. 
So 313 men was more than enough to stop that caravan. Uh, yet the army comes in between. So these are people, you know, so these remaining people had no idea as to what was going to happen. Hmm? Otherwise they would have been there. So the same thing with the case of Imam Hussein al Islam. None of these people who came and said to Imam Hussein al Islam, please don't go, or the people who supported him in Mecca and, and were you know, close to the Prophet even before, none of them even imagined that this could happen, that what happened would end up happening. And the way we know this, we know this through various sources, but one of the easiest way to know this is that there was a poet named Faraz Dawr. He, con he is considered by most Arabs to be the best of Arab poets. Uh, uh, and he had a close connection to the father of Imam Hussein al Islam, as well as connection to the household. So he, at this time, was entering Mecca with his mother to come and make the Hajj as Imam Hussein al-Islam is leaving Mecca. He is coming from Kufa. Uh, so he's coming from where Imam Hussein al-Islam is headed towards. This is where he's going. He also doesn't know everything else that's transpired in between. Uh, because he left a while back, and now he's, you know, he's arrived in, in Mecca. And as Farazdaq is coming in and Imam Hussein al-Islam is going out. Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, who is a companion of the Prophet sallam, meets Farazdaq. And he says to Farazdaq that why don't you go with him? You know that you want to. And he says to Abdullah ibn uh, Amr uh, radiallahu anhu, he says that I would, but I'm afraid what the people will do to him. And the response of Abdullah ibn Amr is, what will the people do to him? This is the grandson of the Prophet, peace be upon him. What will they do to him? You know, meaning, how will anybody harm him? This is the grandson of the Prophet, peace be upon him. No one will, will harm him. And Farazdaq, you know, he had seen uh, things that, that, and he had, had seen things from the inside because he had been hired as the poet of the government, the government poet. Uh, and so he had seen things, so he understood certain things that the common people didn't truly understand. Okay. So, you know, when Imam Hussein al Islam leaves, and when people along the way they realize who he is, there, there are various people who start joining him. Uh, because they know who he is, they know, you know, uh, they want to be with him, and or superficially, some, most of them superficially want to be with him. There are a few that are true. Uh, you know, you know who, who's your friend. You know when times are tough. When times are good, everybody's your friend. Yeah, that's just the way it is. Uh, you know, when times are tough, that's that's when you know who your real friends are. Um, and so, uh, so at this time, there's no threat. So everybody wants to come and join him along the way. Uh, and then as they're traveling, you know, there are people coming back and forth to Mecca from Kufa, and they receive word of the martyrdom of Muslim bin Aqib, of his cousin, uh, in Kufa. And now, you know, it's like, oh, okay, what happened? Because he just has sent the letter that everything's good, so come on. Of course, you know, just sent then isn't like here, you know, you get the letter in, in you know, even a long distance letter, you know, you get in a couple of days. Uh, definitely not like today where you just shoot an email or make a phone call. You know, letters took weeks to come back and forth. And so he had, he had at that time just sent the letter, meaning, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, you know, that everything's good, come on. And now they're receiving the word that, oh, he's been martyred. So the discussion takes place between what do we do? And there were some who said, oh, let's go back. Uh, and, uh, and others who said, no, let's go forward. And Imam Hussein Islam is amongst those who said, you know, he knew what his intention was. He knew what he had to do.
to safeguard the religion, and so he said, we, we go forward. And so the decision is to move, to, to move forward. And not long after this is when uh, the first army that Ibn Ziyad sends against them arrives. So this is an army of a thousand men. And the general in charge of the army, or the leader of the army, is uh, Harub bin Yazid, Rifai. So if it's a different Yazid, but Har, Har. So Har, um, he's from Kufa, uh, but he is a man of uh, character. So he approaches Imam Hussein Islam, respectfully approaches him and says to him, he says, you know, I've been sent to arrest you. Uh, because there is word that you're coming to uh, uh, create a revolt or rebellion against this government, uh, and uh, so I'm sent to arrest you. And Imam Hussein Islam says, why, why are you sent to arrest me when the people of Kufa are the ones who have invited me? And it's not like I just picked up and left and I'm coming to Kufa to create an issue. They are the ones who invited me. Uh, and so he says, well, I have no knowledge of this. So Imam Hussein Islam asked his men to bring the letters, and they brought, they literally brought hundreds of letters. Yeah, and even if they weren't hundreds, because you ah, they weren't hundreds, they were only like 80 or 90. Well, I mean, that's still a lot of letters. Yeah. So they bring out all the letters, he shows them to, you know, Haru bin Yazid, and Haru says, he says, you know, I swear I had no knowledge of this. I did not have any knowledge of this. And he says, look, I'm not going to arrest you. you know, he, like I said, he has, he, this is a man who has decency in him. He says, I'm not going to arrest you, but you know, you're headed towards Kufa. My orders are to bring you to Kufa, so my army will simply walk alongside with you. Uh, of course, when, when this first army comes, some of those folks who had come and joined now disappear. <laughs> Uh, so again, when trouble starts coming, that's when you start knowing who your real friends are. Uh, and, uh, and in most instances, you can literally count your real friends in one hand or less. Yeah, because everybody, like when times are good, hey, oh, I'm, I'm your friend. And these days it's so distorted is, you know, you have, you know, social media and, you know, I got, I got 15,000 friends on Facebook. I don't know a single one of them, you know. <laughs> That's just the way it is now. You know, even the word friend has become so diluted and abused. Because most people that people consider their friends are simply acquaintances. And there's a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, So they continue on the path, but one interesting thing to note here is that whenever time for salat or prayer would come, Hur would leave his men. They would make their, their prayer, you know, they had their scholars and stuff, and they would make their prayers. But Hur would come and pray behind Imam Hussein al Islam. And he does this the whole time. Uh, and then he would go back and so they continue this journey together until finally on the second of the month of Muharram, they arrive in what is now known as Karbala. Uh, the original name of Karbala, or one of the names of Karbala before it was Karbala, was Taf. And Karbala is actually a, is a, um, conjunction of two words. Karbobala, uh, which uh, basically means, you know, you can define it as a place of uh, calamity uh, or atrocity. Uh, and so when they arrive at this point, um, you know, Imam Hussein al-Islam, he asks, uh, a person passing by, what is this place? And he says, stuff. And he tells, he, he knows. But these are things, they do these things so that other people know. 
these are people who uh, are guides and teachers. Uh, so they do things so that it becomes clear to, to, to people what is going on and why they are doing what they're doing. And everything that they do has significance and meaning. You know, again, unlike today, you know, where we waste most of our time. Uh, and so when he's, when he's told, when the person responds, he says, he tells his people, he says, stop and pitch your tents here. This is where we will stand. Because this is where Rasulullah said we will stand. This is where the Prophet had said he would stand. And so they stop there. Uh, and they pitch their tents. Uh, and he digs, uh, you know, you have the tents for the women folks and stuff, and behind those tents he has a ditch dug. Because he knows Again, he, he, he has a clear understanding that someone who has no guidance, who has no, no fear of Allah, you know, who, does, who has no fear of any replications, who does not, you know, who does not remember death, does not think that he will ever be account held accountable for what he's done. Uh, you know, these are people who, again, who have no limits. They have no problems killing people, uh, torturing people, you know, and so many other things, so long as they can make a profit, so long as they think that they're benefiting. But again, they forget that this world is temporary. Uh, and, and that's the interesting thing. Everybody acknowledges death. Everybody, you know, if you talk to anybody, everybody says that, yeah, you know, they will eventually die. If someone thinks that they won't, you know, everybody says, oh, he's just delusional, right? Everybody, but, but the interesting thing is that when we talk about it, most of us don't think about ourselves, we think about somebody else. Yeah. But if we think about it in perspective for ourselves, then that should drive us to do the right thing. Because we know that we will be held accountable for what we've done. We will be asked about what we've done. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will give us, will, will do justice. Even though in reality we don't want his justice because we know ourselves. And if he's just to us, then where will we be? We want his mercy. And so we pray for his mercy but at the same time, we don't want to do things that we know displease him. And so this is, this is why people who have no faith, who have no um, guidance, true guidance, you know, they have no problems doing anything. And again, Imam Hussain Islam totally understands this. Other people will wake up to this. And, you know, after what happens will happen. And so when they pitch the tents, uh, you know, and Ibn Ziyad, who's sitting in Kufa, and Kufa is not very far from, from Karbala. You know, it's like uh, on horseback, just, you know, just a short distance. And you go, and so he goes, so you have messengers coming back and forth. Uh, um, I think I'll stop here today. I think it's a good spot to stop. Uh, inshallah, we'll continue next week. Uh, and I'll keep reiterating certain points. Uh, because again, you know, when we, when, especially when we start talking about things that, that happen in the field of Karbala on that day, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَلَنَبْلُوا أَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَلَنَبْلُوا أَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجِوَانُ وَنَقْسٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفِسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ That indeed, uh, you will be tested uh, with things of uh, fear, hunger, loss of wealth, loss of your lives, loss of your offsprings. And then he says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ But glad tidings to those who are 
patient. And patient doesn't mean indifferent or procrastinating or any of the other things that we connect it with today. Patient means to do what I know that my, that, that my Lord wants me to do, has, has commanded me to do, to do all of those things, and then wherever, and then be pleased with whatever the outcome is. So long as I know that I've done what I, I'm supposed to do uh, to please my Lord, then I'm pleased with whatever happens. Okay. So, any questions? No? Everything's clear? Okay, good. Nazir? Sharif? Wa alaikum salam. Anything? Okay, so no questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we'll, uh, like I said, I think this is a good spot to uh, stop uh, because, inshallah. yeah, inshallah, because next week we'll start talking about uh, all the armies that, all the various armies that come in and the generals that, that are brought in, uh, which, you know, that's one interesting point here, though, is, you know, even that initial army that's sent, it's a thousand man army, armed army, you know, this is an army. They're ready to fight. That's sent against 72 people who aren't armed to fight. And in those people includes women and children. Mm -hmm. So this also tells us that, you know, truth, uh, or rather falsehood, understands the strength of truth, whether the people on truth understand it themselves or not. Imam Hussein Islam, of course, he is the truth. He knows the truth. He understands the truth. Uh, but uh, falsehood understands the truth and understands the strength of the truth. And so this is why, I mean, he, he could have simply sent you know, a couple of hundred men. That would have been plenty, right? He doesn't send a couple of hundred men. He sends a thousand men army initially. And this is to the initial one. This army is going to grow and grow. Okay. Uh, and and we, again, we see the same thing today. Whenever they come against truth, they always form some type of coalition, and it's this overwhelming force that they come with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so this, isn't, this isn't something new that we're seeing today, and this has been going on from the beginning. Uh, and uh, so, so, you know, th there are lessons in that as well for, for us. And all of this, again, we connect back to everything that's going on today. I mean, the connection should be obvious to anyone who knows and anyone who can see what is going on. Okay. So, inshallah, we'll end here. Uh, you know, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him, his companions, his, 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 uh, his household, and all of those whom they love. And may he give us the strength. Uh, to stand up for what's right uh, and may give our brothers and sisters in Abazza and, and wherever people are being oppressed the strength to overcome their oppressors. Uh,